good afternoon. Thanks for attending this session. And, and yeah, thanks, Nikita, for that great introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing in the home IoT security space. And this work is done in collaboration with some great researchers at Avast Software and Stanford University. So we spend a lot of time as a security community thinking about securing home IoT devices. And you know, this is for good reason, because attackers keep packing our hair straighteners and light bulbs and then stringing them together to launch massive DDoS attacks on the internet or whatever, so the media says. But what, as it turns out, in spite of all that attention on device security or platform security, we, we actually have very little insight into the home IoT ecosystem as a whole. And this is not a failing of the research community, but rather a measurement perspective challenge. Right? So our typical mechanism for learning about internet devices is to scan for them on the public internet, but we, we can't do that for home IoT devices that are typically behind NATs. However, understanding this ecosystem and its resultant security challenges can help focus our efforts as a security community on better protecting IoT. So in this, in this talk and in this work, we sought to answer this kind of core question. You know, what does the home IoT ecosystem look like? So as I mentioned, you know, we can't publicly scan for these devices, so we needed a different measurement perspective. And to get that perspective, we partnered with Avast Software, who is a, a free antivirus provider whose home security software runs in millions of homes worldwide. And as part of their home security software package, Avast uh, products come packaged with a tool called Wi-Fi Inspector. Uh, Wi-Fi Inspector performs internal network scans of the local network and checks devices for indicators of weak security that they then alert to the user so the user can, t can take care of whatever problems they have on their network. And in total, Wi-Fi Inspector does three things. So it does uh, device inventory and identification, which lets the user know what all the currently connected devices on their network are. And it then probes those devices for weak default credentials on popular services and vulnerabilities to known recent CVEs that they can test without breaking the device themselves. So to kind of illustrate this, I'm going to walk through a very quick example. Let's say this is your home deployment. You've got four devices. You've got a router, a surveillance camera, a smart thermostat, as well as a computer that's running the Avast Home security software. And so what the tool does is it starts its process by actively probing devices and increasing IP order via ICMP, TCP, and UDP, and figures out what services are open on each device. So you know, if your router might speak HTTPS and DNS and Telnet, your uh, camera might have FTP and SSH and Telnet, and your thermostat might have an HTTPS server, speak UPnP for device discovery, and you know, whatever, also run a Telnet server, because why not? Wi-Fi Inspector then uses this information to collect application layer data about each device. So for example, if you know, port 80 or 443 is open, Wi-Fi Inspector will make an HTTP request to the root page of the device and collect and store that information. It also collects you know, semantically rich broadcast and multicast traffic via protocols like DHCP, MDNS, and UPnP on the network. And it uses all of this application layer data to basically perform device identification. So the goal of device ID in the, for the scope of this paper and the scope of their product is to put a device into one of 14 different device classes. These are the device classes. I'm not going to say all of them. But of these, we deem 11 of them to be IoT devices for the scope of this work. We excluded computers, routers, and mobile devices in our discussion of IoT, but we kept them in the context of you know, the number of devices on the network, as well as their security posture on the network. So how does device ID work? Well, device identification works primarily through two mechanisms. The first of which is what you know, we call network rules, which are essentially regular expressions that were manually curated by inspecting the network behavior of a large set of known devices. So in total, there are about 1,000 rules in the, in the software over various fields. And in practice, this is great at labeling, say, around 60% of devices in, in a random validation set. But obviously, this requires tons of manual analysis. I think in the case of Avast, this was over three years of effort of looking at packets and trying to extract regular expressions. So what do these rules look like? They, they look something like this. So for example, if you're able to capture the HTTP title of a given device, and that title contains some combination of polycom slash sound point or sound station IP or something like that, then this thing is most likely a networked phone. So how do you cover the remaining 40% of devices? Then Avast uses a supervised machine learning approach over several network properties to classify the rest of the devices. So I want to give you uh, a brief uh, introduction and a little bit more detail into this. That model is actually an ensemble model of a number of different models that leverage various network features, like the IP address of the device, the MAC address of the device, listening services, and application layer responses as you know, features into each model. 
The model was trained over a labeled, data, uh, over a labeled set of 500,000 devices that were collected from real world, real world scans. 200,000 of these were manually labeled through a, a clustering and a winnowing process, and 300,000 were labeled by the network rules that I, I mentioned before. So the model was then tested on a set of 1,000 manually labeled, never before seen devices. And in total, the ensemble model is able to cover about 92% of the devices in the testing set and is able to classify them into the appropriate device class with 96% accuracy and an F1 score of 0.08. So this gives us you know, reasonable confidence in its ability to perform device identification. So I want to briefly you know, touch on some of the ethical considerations that we thought about when we were running the study. So first, Avast only shared with us aggregate data. So they aggregated by device manufacturer or region and device type. And as a result, no personally identifiable data was ever shared with the research team. So this includes, for example, the IP address of, of your home. And, and finally, although a vast Wi-Fi inspector you know, does actually run automatically as part of the product, for our data set, scans are all user initiated and they're never automated. And we did this because you know, we wanted to limit the possibility that someone's data would be used on accident or included in the study without their express knowledge that Avast was scanning their network and scanning it for vulnerabilities. All right, cool, that's great. And this brings us to our final data set. You know, in total, our data set consists of internal network scans collected from 15.5 million homes across 83 million devices and 11 geographic regions. So this brings us to what, you know, answering the first question, we're now well poised to do this. What do home networks actually look like? Uh, to start, let's take a look at where the IoT devices are. So what I'm showing you here is a table that outlines the home IoT devices per region, sorted by the, the fraction of homes in each region that have an IoT device. So at the helm are regions like North America, Western Europe, and Oceania. In the, in the largest case, over two-thirds of American ho North American homes contain at least one IoT device. North American homes also have the highest number of median devices per home, with a median of seven devices in a household. Now, on the other end are regions like South and Central Asia and North Africa and the Middle East. In the smallest case, only 8.7% of the homes in South Asia have at least one IoT device. And the median number of devices in those homes is two, which basically means just the computer performing the scan and the router. And so off the bat, you know, we're starting to see some differences in the deployment of IoT devices around the world. And the next question we asked broadly was, you know, empirically, based on this data set, what are these devices? To dig into this question, what I want to start with is taking a look at just a typical kind of North American home. So my biases before starting this project was like, okay, Americans, you know, we probably have like Alexas and maybe some toasters and some light bulbs and hair straighteners. But, but I was surprised to find that the top devices in North American homes are actually media devices, printers, and game consoles. These are not things we typically think about when we're talking about IoT devices. And in the largest case, media devices are found in 43% 43 43 of American homes. And what are these devices? Well, they're like smart TVs and Chromecasts and Apple TVs and Amazon Fire Sticks. In fact, only in a relatively, number of small, a relatively small number of homes do we see voice assistants, which show up, say, in 10% of homes, and home automation devices, like nests and light bulbs and garage door openers, which show up in just 2% you know, of homes. So how does this, how does this look you know, globally? If you look at this the device type distributions worldwide, you can actually start to tease out you know, some, some similarities and differences. So for example, media devices are not just the most popular device in North America. They are actually the most popular in seven out of the 11 regions in our data set. And home automation devices and voice assistants, well, actually, they're really only prevalent, you know, meaning in more than 1% of homes in North America, Western Europe, and Oceania. So, you know, what are all of the other devices? Well, it, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag, depending on the region you look, like, look at. But, for example, in South and Southeast Asia, where notably there are fewer homes with IoT devices, surveillance devices are very popular, making up 54% of all devices in South Asia. And work appliances are the most common device type in East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, and they make up more than 50% of the devices you know, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And you know what, I can like go on documenting the fine grained differences between regions, and if you're into that, you're more than welcome to check out the paper. But broadly, what we found is that each region has unique device type preferences. And so the types of devices that you find to be most popular vary depending on the region you're looking at. And so now we know, okay, IoT devices are distributed une unevenly around the world and that different regions have different device type preferences. The next question we looked at was, who is making these devices? So to answer this, we, we took a look at the vendors and the manufacturers for devices around the world. Globally, we found that there were about 
13,500 unique manufacturers by their IEEE uh, organizationally unique identifier, and in some regions had up to 10,000 different vendors. So, so how do we tackle this? The first thing we investigated was the fraction of total devices that vendors cover per region. So what I'm, what I'm showing you here is a CDF of the vendors by how many devices they cover where vendors are ranked by their popularity in each region. And what we observed is that in spite of the fact that each region has you know, upwards of thousands of vendors, in every case, just a small fraction of them are ac actually make up the majority of the devices that are popular in each region. So in fact, for every region, 90% of the IoT devices are manufactured by just 100 vendors. But you know, the flip side of this is that, of course, there is a long tail of small vendors that make up the other 10% of devices, you know, pointing and, and hinting at a, a much more complex vendor ecosystem. However, you know, although this kind of uh, result holds in aggregate per region, the observation is not as neat if you take a look at vendors by device type. So, so what I'm showing you here is, is the exact same graph, the exact same idea, except it's grouped by device types rather than by region. And what we see is a split between different device types. So for example, game consoles and voice assistants are largely dominated by a handful of vendors. There's just two vendors, Google and Amazon, that make up more than 90% of the voice assistants that we surveyed in, in this study. And in game consoles, there are three vendors, Sony, Nintendo, and Microsoft, that make up more than 90% of the market. So there, there are certain device types where, we start, where we're seeing these kinds of centralization in vendors. However, you know, conversely, there are other device types that are far more heterogeneous. So for example, media devices are the most heterogeneous device type in our data set, with the top 10 manufacturers only accounting for 60% of all devices, and surveillance devices are, are close second. Now, that's not to say that there aren't obviously major players in all of these device types. For example, Hikvision, a Chinese company that makes CCTVs, accounts for 18.4% of all surveillance cameras globally and has a strong presence in almost every region. But, but broadly, we find that you know, vendor diversity really does also depend on device type. And, and for this, for this, the reason for this is that some device types, uh, for some device types, you know, different regions actually tend to prefer different vendors. So for example, in Western Europe, the most popular media vendors are vendors like Sagecom and Free, who are French companies and manufacture set-top boxes and DVRs. But in the US, our most popular media vendors are Google and Amazon and Apple. And so ultimately what this is pointing to is kind of a complex ecosystem with thousands of actors and regional device differences. And the last thing I, talk, I want to talk about then is, okay, well, given this complex ecosystem, what does that actually mean for IoT security? Well, security is, is, is big and broad, as we know, uh, and it means many things. It's hard to quantify in a very heterogeneous system. And so what attackers are doing today are the simplest things. They're looking for devices with weak credentials and vulnerabilities to known recent CVEs. And in this work, we check for the presence of weak credentials kind of as a proxy for security. So specifically, we're looking for the distribution of weak credentials across FTP and Telnet, two still popular services that are used to administer IoT devices. So you recall that a vast Wi-Fi inspector tests for this as part of the product and alerts the user about weak credentials so you know, they can mitigate any issues. The way we test for these is by you know, using a list of common default credential, credentials, things like admin, admin, root, root, admin, root, those kinds of things. So what do we find? Well, we found that 7.8% of devices support FTP and 7.1% of devices still support Telnet. And when we took a look at the devices that supported FTP, in general, you know, they kind of made sense. You know, these are largely work appliances. They make up about 78% of all FTP devices and storage devices that make up about 9% of, of FTP devices. You know, you could kind of ostensibly see why such devices need FTP in order to properly function. Conversely, 7.1% of devices still support Telnet, and I don't I don't know why. Um, now, of these, 17.4% exhibit uh, of the FTP devices exhibit weak FTP credentials, and 2.1% of the Telnet devices exhibit weak Telnet credentials. And if you dig into the Telnet devices a little bit more, you actually find that the devices that support Telnet come mostly from four categories: surveillance devices, routers, home appliances, and media devices. Of these, surveillance devices and routers have the weakest observed security. And in the most egregious case, 10.7% of surveillance devices that support Telnet offer weak credentials. 
Now tie that back into the fact that there are countries that have lots of surveillance devices. And of course, there is a correlation between the percentage of devices uh, in your region that are surveillance devices and the percentage of weak telnet devices. And kind of a darker thing that this highlights is that there are regions that are at a disproportionate higher risk of security just given the fact that they purchase certain kinds of devices. And of course, this is important because we exist in a global internet, right? If an attacker gets a bot in South America, they're going to use it to attack services globally. And if you need a reminder of this, just think back to those initial Mirai attacks from 2016, where the infections and the scanners appeared globally. So broadly, and although it's one size of the puzzle here, security challenges vary per region depending on device preferences, indicating another complication in a growing heterogeneous IoT ecosystem. Okay, so what do we learn? Well, the home IoT ecosystem is diverse and it is fragmented. And when you look at this globally, there are regional devices at almost every level in terms of the number of devices, the device types, the vendors that they prefer. And this fragmented ecosystem you know, leads to kind of challenges in quantifying security. So there's not gonna be one silver bullet and it's, it's challenging for us as a community to figure out what exactly we need to focus on. In this study, we looked at you know, the lowest common denominator, weak passwords, but there's a lot unknown still in order to measure the security of these devices at scale. And the last thing I wanna call out is that IoT, you know, it's actually been here for years. And as we investigate new and fun devices and we break them in cool and fun ways, let's not forget that there are all of the other devices that exist and that are still running Telnet. <laughs> anyway, that is uh, the, my time and, and the end of my talk. At this point, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Deepak. Uh, let, let me start off with a kind of obvious question, which is, uh, do you have any sense for what the demographics are of the people who run a vast uh, Wi-Fi scanner and how those differ from the overall yeah, demographics? It's a really good question. So, I mean, obviously, you know, we, these are people that are running uh, some kind of uh, security software. So the guess is that they are more security conscious. They may all, this may inflate the number of devices and the security posture of those devices may actually be better. So there's one, in our, in our kind of, our intuition is that you know, perhaps this is actually a, a upper bound in terms of the uh, amount, or lower bound in terms of the number of security uh, problems that we see in the ecosystem, so. Thank you. Uh, and I guess uh, everyone else is really excited about the snacks outside. So before you go, let's uh, give a big round of applause to all the speakers in this session. <laughs>